I want to talk a bit about uh, the story of Purim and tie it into something that's relatable to us and to today. So something that you can all take with you. So it's not going to be like so much of the story, but more of a lesson that we can take from it. So we know that Achashverosh made a feast. And this feast was to celebrate. He celebrated for 180 days. Can you imagine a feast going on for 180 days? Crazy stuff. And it wasn't a simple thing. Every single person who came had a a wine based on his age. It was considered luxurious if you were a 90-year-old to have a 90-year-old wine. Well, if that was the case, I wouldn't be so excited about getting a 90-year-old wine. But never mind. Um, but he, it was a very royal Dava Sochare. There was beautiful marble. There's uh, descriptions also, not just by uh, the Jewish book, but also by the architects and, and people that have discovered some of what was going on back in those days and how they celebrated. It was something so lavish that can't be described. So the end of 180 days of this feast... And by the way, he was feasting not only with, he took out, this was at the end of the first temple being destroyed. And the Jews were now in 70 years of the first exile. They were in uh, the Babylonian exile and they got sent to Persia because the Persians took over. And they were under the Persian exile as well. And that was the time that they were going to go back to uh, Israel and get the second temple. So it was just prior to them getting the second temple. And they had a prophecy that told them, just like we have a lot of prophecies, they had a prophecy then that told them that they were going to go back to Israel and they're going to rebuild the temple. However, Achashverosh, in his own way, who fought his way, he was a man that didn't even have the right to his country. Um, He didn't have any royal blood to him. But he fought his way and became the king of 127 different countries. It's basically the entire world. Besides for Alexander the Great, he was one of the, the, the most powerful people in history, was this man called Achashverosh. He was a very, very powerful man. And uh, he celebrated this celebration because he realized that for sure, the Jews are not going back to Israel and the temple has finally been destroyed. For sure, the temple's been destroyed. So he was very excited about it. And that's why he was making a celebration. He took out some of the the stuff that we had in the temple, the menorah. He took out, well, whatever he could. Uh, I don't think actually he had the menorah, but he took out a lot of what we had from the temple and he put it in front of the table as well. He took out big day kuna, the clothings of the Kohen, the priest, and he put it on and he was making himself proud to show that we have destroyed and that's it, it's over, the Jews are not going to go back because the Jewish people were the superpower of that time. For 410 years, we had Solomon built the first temple and we had the temple for 410 years and the whole world would come to Jerusalem to serve not just the Jews but everyone from the world would come to Jerusalem and it was a big, big uh, celebration that we would have. So for the Jewish people before the temple, first temple was destroyed was considered like the, the most wealthy country of the world. They, they lived in Israel for many years. They were extremely influential, extremely powerful. And Achashverosh, after the 410 years of the destruction and the 70 years that the Jews are now exiled from Israel, he's happy. He says, wow, that's it. They're done. They're not going to go back to Israel. And he celebrates 180 days of celebration. At the end of this celebration that you cannot imagine, words cannot describe even what is written. The Medrash goes on about different ways of how he celebrated this 180 days. Can you half a year feasting? At the end of this, he does one more celebration for seven days. So it's really 187 days. The 180 days of his celebration fell on the 3rd of Tishrei, after Rosh Hashanah. And the seven days of him feasting for the locals of his town, the main city that he was in, in Persia, was Shushan. The, the main province, the main, um, the capital of his, of his wealth was Shushan. That was where 
the most royal place was where everyone could be. And in Shushan, he made one more party of seven days. And the rabbis say, according to one opinion, he was smart. Why was he smart? Because everybody was getting angry with him. They were saying, oh, you're wasting our tax dollars. You're spending 180 days partying. Ah, the king is having fun whilst we are all suffering and he's taking all our money and this is what he's doing with our money. It's no different than today. Right? The same talk of politics today is the talks back then. And they said, right, we're talking about 2000, 2,000 years ago. So they said, more, 2,500 years ago. So they said, um, he's taking over all the tax dollars, he's using all the money. So he decided, do you know what I'm going to do? For the people of my area, for my locals, to bring them close to me, I'm going to make a celebration. I can, I can take this off. Of I just feel uncomfortable. So I'm going to make a celebration of, 100, uh, of, of seven days for everybody in my local so they don't get upset with me. He also ordered and organized all the kings of all the different provinces that he was in charge of. Their leaders, he says to them, you know, all the, all the officers, and he was the main king, but all the officers and the important people of each place, he brings them as well. And they all sit together and they have a uh, celebration for send seven days. What happens at the end of those seven days? Can you imagine? 180 days plus seven. And the last seven days was like mind-blowing. So 187 days of, of celebration. What happens at the end of the 187 days? He says he has an argument with all the officers. There were people from Madai. There were people from all different places. And each one said, our queens are nicer. Our women are more beautiful. And this one said, oh, women, are, they weren't very correct in those days. They were very open about it. Maybe today people do the same thing. I mean, when guys talk, they do the same. So, uh, our, our girls are nicer. And this one said, our girls are nicer. Unless you're an Orthodox Jew, which you shouldn't be talking like this. Right? But they said, our girls are nicer. These ones said, our girls are nicer. Our women are nicer. And Achashverosh was absolutely drunk. 187 days of drinking. And he says, ah, there's no one like... My wife, Vashti, she's more beautiful than all of them. And he orders his wife, who had a separate celebration in those days, they had a queen's house and they had the king's house. It wasn't like it is today where the king and queen just hang out together, you know, husband and wife hang out together like the, the separate homes. You have to ask to get into the king's home. It wasn't just like... So the queen had her own party, Vashti. And in her party, she had also a massive, lavish celebration and for months on end. And Achashverosh in his drunkenness says, bring Vashti here. I want to see her and bring her with just the crown on. He says, Beketem Malchut, or Rabbi say, just the crown, meaning without any clothes on. I want to show her off to everybody. She had no problem with that, but she developed a leprosy and her rabbis explained that she had that because she would actually and the reason why she was called to be without clothes on was it was a decree on her because she would make every single Shabbat all the Jewish women of her town come and work in her uh, palace in her home they would have to work there and they would have to work there without clothes on so the rabbis say that midah keneged midah measure for measure because she went and did that, she was also told to do the same thing in front of the king. Nothing happens for no reason. Every mm -hmm. single thing that happens in this world happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. So, um, but here's the point. This is where I want to get to. I'm not going to go through the whole story of, of, of Purim. I want to get to this point here. He feasted for 187 days. And do you know what, the, do you know what it says in the Megillah? What does it say? I'll tell you the words. After 187 days, Bayom Hashavi'i, which happened to be, by the way, on Yom Kippur, because I told you, seven days was celebrated on the 3rd of Tishrei, just after Rosh Hashanah. Seven days later, the end of the feasts, of everything, of 187 days, it landed on Yom Kippur. And many, many Jews were there, which was why there was a decree against the Jews because of that. But it was on that day, the seventh day 
on Yom Kippur he made his final feast. And you know what it says? It says, Ketov, Ketov, Lev HaMelech. It says, it was like it was good for the king. It doesn't say, Tov LaMelech. It was Ketov. He was still lacking. After 180, do you understand? 187 days of partying and something's still not good enough for him. And he has to call his wife Vashti. And that was the point of his destruction. We all know the story. He was drunk and in his drunkenness, he first calls the rabbis. He says, I want to get the wisest people. He calls the rabbis, he says, can you tell us what to do? We should we, what should we do with Vashti? She's not coming. She refuses to come. She's embarrassing me. All, my, all the kings here are waiting for me to show off my wife without clothes on. <laughs> and she's embarrassing me. She's not coming. She's refusing to come. What kind of embarrassment is that? So he decides to call the rabbis. He calls the ones that know how to calculate times and months. and He calls all the scholars that were there from the times of the temple. The greatest rabbis that we had. He calls them, they, they knew that whatever they answered, they'll get in trouble. If they say, let her go, he'll get, he'll get angry. He's, he's angry. He's 187 days drinking. He's nuts. He's crazy. If they just say, if the rabbis would say, let her go, do you know what she'll do? Do you know what Achashverosh will do? He'll say, what do you mean, let her go? She's, she's, she's ridiculing the honor of the king. You can't just let her go. And if we would say, this is what the rabbis had a problem, if we would say, kill her tomorrow after he gets drunk and he has his hangover, right? The next morning when he, after he's drunk, he's like, who told me to kill my wife, right? So whatever answer the rabbis gave, they knew that they were going to be in, in trouble because they would get blamed for it afterwards. So what did they do? They got out of it. How did they get out of it? They said... Ever since the temple's been destroyed, we don't have the same power as we used to. We don't have the same wisdom as we used to. I think that it's better you go to a different pe uh, people. They got out of it. Shows, by the way, if you know that somebody is not going to take charge of your decisions, meaning they're not going to take responsibility for your decisions. Someone comes up to you and asks you, should I go on a... a, a and should I take this job or not? Should I do it or not? They're a good friend of yours. If you would say, some people, if you say to them, yeah, take the job, take the job. Afterwards, when that job doesn't work out, they'll come back to you. Ah, why did he tell me to take the job? You know these type of people? Because they can't take the responsibility. You have to be very careful. When you say something to somebody, you have to know if they're willing to take the responsibility themselves. If not... And they're going to come back to you. That's dangerous, right? It's going to bounce off to you. Don't, don't get yourself in that danger. Avoid answering the question. This is a lot. This happens a lot to me. People come to me and ask me advice. And I have to know what kind of reason, what reason they're asking me the advice for. Are they asking me so that they can be shed completely off the responsibility? Then it means that afterwards, they're going to come back to me and I'm going to be the one in trouble. You hear what's going on? You told me. The rabbis knew that it was too dangerous. And because of that, they pushed it off. They said, we can't do it in a very smart way. They didn't say, they said, we've lost our, we don't have the ability to think after the destruction of the temple in the way that we used to. But the, what, the point here is, I want to speak about is Ketov Lev HaMelech. He was not happy. Why was he not happy? 187 days of partying and celebrations, still not good enough? What's going on? <laughs> Listen to what Listen to what the Midrash says. Because, because it's so, this is the point that I want to get to. Because this is the, there's so much that you can learn from the Megillah. But this, this message for me is, it says, Why? The Midrash says, It was like it was good for the king. Why? It doesn't say it was good. It says it was like it was good. It was good, but not fully good. Why? Because for the world, umot ha'olam, for the nations of the world, for those that are not going in the right path, okay? En lahem tova, they don't really have good. How do I know? As it says in a verse in Proverbs, v'tov lo yiyeh l'rasha. Good is never good enough 
for an evil person. For the wicked, good is never good enough. They don't have good. In fact, good doesn't exist. They never live long. Life goes too quickly like a shadow. Because they have no fear of God. What does this mean? A wicked person never has good? That's what he says. But the good that the Jewish people choose on themselves is real, complete good. Why? As it says, When they study in the tents, when they study, they are happy and they have good to its complete level of good, to its absolute level of good. What's going on here? So I want to bring out this language of tov, good, happiness, good. When is good really defined and when is it not? Because we need to get it to the core of this if we want to be happy in our lives and we want to be filled with tov, tov, good. Okay, so what can we do to make sure that we have tov? So this is the words of the Mesilat Yeshurim. Excuse me, I'm going to be translating a lot of Hebrew here, but stay with me because it's, to me it's mind-blowing. When you think about it, this is what he says. Completion, true, absolute completion, is only when somebody is close to God. This is what David HaMelech says. Vani kilvat Elohim litov. To me, being close to God. To me, I don't know about you. I don't know about anybody else. But to me, kilvat Elohim litov. It's good for me to be close to God. And it says... One thing I ask, and that's the only thing I ask. I want to sit in the house of Hashem all my life. I don't want anything else. To flip from my throne, from my, my, my phone, to watch movies, another Netflix. It's all fake. Nothing's real. There's only one thing that's real to me that's being close to you. That's the only thing this is good. This is a big Kabbalistic rabbi. The Mesilat Yesharim was written by Ramosha Chaim Lutzato in the 18th century. One of the most Kabbalistic. He says like this. Anything else that you think, you imagine is really good, is not. It's only emptiness and it's just misleading. Misleading you in the wrong directions. If a person wants to have this good, he has to work for it. You can't have good without working. And that means that you have to work to be close to God. What does that mean? To do the right actions that will bring you to that closeness. Which means to be like Him. And what is that? How do you be like Him? Through the mitzvot. By giving charity. By being kind. By speaking well. By not saying lashanara. All the mitzvot that we have are all ways of you to be close to God. That means you're close to because just like God is infinite, and He doesn't take, so too. And He only gives, He creates my heart pump. My heart's beating every second. Every second. Love, love, love. So much love. Who's, my brain is functioning every second. There's an infinite amount of love that's going on in my body right now, as we speak. So much good. So He says... You have to work in order to think about this good. And that's through doing good actions as well. Not just thinking, but also doing action. And that's through the mitzvot. And that's why Hashem put us in this world. In a place where there's many things that distract us from Him. There's so many distractions. And this is all the physical desires that we have that push us in the wrong directions if we overuse them. Judaism is not against having desires. It's not against enjoying the physical world, but it's against us abusing the physical world. When we make that the goal, then we forget ourselves. When we make that the goal, you forget your inner self. If you follow and drive yourself too much after them, eventually you're going to distance yourself more and more from the true good, thinking that that's where the good is. But really, you're distancing yourself more and more from the real good. Hey! Guess how I came successful, right? This is the, everyone's posting their vulnerable stories of how they came so successful in the past 10 years. They started off like this and they became like this. And look, they're sharing the whole story with the world. That makes me successful. No, it's not necessarily. It might make you more financially 
successful, but then it might also drive you away from the true good. You can, you can be financially successful, but never forget who you are and what you're here for. We, we confuse success with happiness. Two different things. You can have people that are very successful and are very unhappy. He says like this, he continues. I'm just reading up a bit of his words because I think that I can't speak like he speaks. <laughs> the rule is, a person wasn't created just to be in this world. There's also more to this world. There's more to the body. There's more than just the physical. His point in this world is a tool to getting him to another world, to a more purposeful world. That's why our rabbis always speak in the same language. They compare this world to a place which is temporary. It's not permanent. And the world to come is the true place of what resting when a person leaves this world. That's why we call this world a corridor. And as it says, today we do and the next tomorrow is when we receive. Somebody who eat, prepares for Shabbat will eat on Shabbat. Meaning, if you can't eat, Shabbat is like the world to come. If you prepare for Shabbat, you'll eat on Shabbat. But if you didn't prepare, you won't have any food. Oh, so I didn't cook. That's how it is from this world to the next. This world is the world where we do. Hayom la sotam. This world is where we do in this world. We act because we, we choose. We're not robots. We get to choose. We have a choice between good and bad. And through that, we, when a person leaves this world, there's no more work. But that's when you really achieve the reward of being who you became and receiving the ultimate goodness of being close to God. So let me just carry on a bit because it's, it's really important. And you will see truthfully, somebody who has real logic can never believe that the point of a human being is just for the human being. Because what is the human being in this world? What is, what, how long are we here? How many people can you say are happy and tranquil in this world completely? How many? How, no, I am. Yeah, but you know what? Our years in this world is only 70 years. If we're strong, we'll make it for 80. This is the verse of Tehillim, Psalms 90. But most of these years are toil and painful. So even if somebody lives till 90, at the end, it's still there's a lot of work and there's money and there's worries and there's bills and there's non-stop. There's so many sicknesses that suddenly come, like COVID. And all different pains and bothersomes and annoyances. And after all this trouble, death. It, it, one in a thousand, you cannot find who, a people that would say that he, in this world he had so much pleasure and tranquil. That's true. When he really thinks about it, even that person, who, if he reaches to 100 years, his life is considered, when you look at him, the hundred years walking down the street, he's, he's on his way out, right? So what was, it, what was the point of it all anyway? Not only that, if the purpose of, of being in this world is for this world only, then why do we need to have such a beautiful neshama, such a beautiful soul that's so important and so valuable so great and so infinite, greater than the Malachim, greater than the angels themselves. The human soul is so much greater than its own self. It questions itself. It asks, where did I come from? It demands respect. Why? Why are we not like cows that just exist, graze on the field, and then after a while, you know, we move on. We're different. We're complicated beings. Why, why is the Neshama so... Why did Hashem have to make us so... Because obviously we're much more than just this world. We have much more. The soul can never find satisfaction in this world. We'll give as an example, this is the example I use a lot, which is brought down as the verse says, The soul can never be satiated. Sometimes people are hungry. They want to fill the soul. So they eat more. They go to the fridge, there's no food to eat. I don't find any food to eat, I'm hungry. They don't realize that that's not... You're looking for the wrong food. There's food for the body, but you also need food for the soul. I need to look more. No, no, I need to look more. I need to look for this and that. And more popularity. And more. 
But what about your soul? We need to feed two things. That's why on Shabbat we eat, we feed the body on Shabbat, but we also need to feed the soul. We sing, we sit with the family, we put away our phone. There's two parts. We bench after the meal, right? There's two parts. There's two parts of you, the body and the soul. This is what our rabbis teach us. In, in and he gives an example. What's the example? Ironi, shenasa bat melachim. A commoner, a simple, in those days, back in the days, a simple person who was worth nothing, pennies, he can't barely eat every day, doesn't know where he's going to get his food for the next day. Suddenly, he's getting married to the daughter of the king. <laughs> Whatever he brings her in the world, it's not going to be important for her. I mean, what does he have already? A few pennies? Whatever he brings her, she has. Nothing's important to her. She is the daughter of the king. So too with the soul. Whatever pleasures we bring it, it's nothing. Because the soul is something, it comes from the higher parts. It comes from the upper worlds. And this is what our rabbis say when they said that when you came into this world, it wasn't your choice. And when you leave this world, it's also not your choice. What does that mean? Because the neshama, when it came, what does it mean it's not your choice to come in this world? Because the neshama, the soul, didn't want to come into a physical, lowly world. It's not fitting for its soul to be in this place. Once it's in it, though, it learns to adapt to it. And then it says, I don't want to leave this world, which is the correct thing to do. Because in this world, you can work through choice. But before it comes into the body, into this world, it would prefer not to be. Does this make sense to you? It's, why, would the, why would God put in such a thing, such a body, something which is against its own essence, physicality? It's not, it wants to be infinite. The real purpose of you is to the world to come, and that's why you have the neshama in it, because it's worth serving and working in order to get the reward through your choices in the world to come. And that's the whole this description that he has. The same thing, by the way, happens with Haman. What did we just say? People that don't live life for the right reasons, they don't have good. They don't have good. What do they have? A car? They want another one. They have a job? They want another one. They have a house? They want another one. They have the house? It's not good enough. They didn't build it this way. They should have built it that way. Right? They, there's no end. There's no end to the physical world. You see it. A person doesn't leave this world with half his desires in him. What does that mean? What do you mean? I had a billion dollars. Yeah, if you have a billion, you wanted two billion. So when you left this world, you only left with half of what you owned. Because you wished you had more. Unless you were happy with the billion that you have. That's exactly how this world works. The same with Haman. You see the whole story. The, the, the Achashverosh. Haman, who was the enemy of the Jews. Same idea. What destroyed Haman? He had everything. He didn't care that he was the second man in command under Achashverosh. He was fine with that. The wealthiest person. Beautiful. We can't even imagine his power and wealth. And what happened? He says, everything, I have everything, but there's one thing that, that I'm missing. This is his language that he says. What's his language? He says, Nothing is worth it for me. Because I can't see Mordechai at the gate of the king bowing down to me. I need that Jew, the leader of the Jewish people, he needs to serve me. And therefore, all of this, all my, this is what he tells his wife, Zeresh, all my wealth, all my success, Everything I have, we're talking like living gods. That's the way they lived. Living gods. Not like today, someone who has power. There's still government and so on. He was a living god. and it, People had to bow down to him when they saw him. But Mordechai refused. Nothing's worth it to me. The whole thing, all my money, all my wealth is worthless to me as long as Mordechai is alive. And he builds a massive gallows in his own house, which eventually was used to kill himself. Amazing. Same language. 
That's what it says in Mishlei as well. In Proverbs it says, Zecher tzadik libracha, v'shem reshaim yukav. Righteous people, even when they're not in the round anymore, they left, they're not here anymore. Ten generations ago. Their memory is a blessing. We talk about them and we say, oh, what a blessing. That they were our legacy. The Gaon of Vilna, the Ramchal, Ramosh Elochayim Lutzato, Mordechai. When we talk about the great people of our history, what do we say? We say they are a blessing. Even when they're not alive anymore, years gone, they're still a blessing to us. But the Shem Reshaim Yukav. But the wicked, this is what, got, this is what the Vilna got on, one of the commentaries explains. The Shem Reshaim Yukav, he says, the wicked, this is brought down in Proverbs, it says, the wicked, their name rots, even when they're alive. The wicked, even when they're alive, no one likes them. Achashverosh, his whole life was worried that maybe someone's going to kill me. And that's why he killed Haman. Because he was worried that maybe Haman's taking over. That's why he couldn't sleep that night. And he, he couldn't sleep. I don't know if you remember the story so well. But he couldn't sleep. And that's when he opened the book of Chronicles. And he said, who did good to me? Ah, maybe it was Mod maybe someone. Maybe someone's trying to hurt me. That's why he was worried. He was worried because he was worried even in his own life, whilst he's alive, maybe someone's going to kill him. V'shem reshaim yilkav. When you see people with power, they're different than people that are appointed as kings. Someone with power, he is not loved by everyone. That's not something that you... That's called V'shem reshaim yilkav. His name is rotted. Even in this world. Most people don't even like him. Even whilst he's alive, they don't like him. But Zechet Tzadik a righteous person, after he lives, even when they talk about him, he's people are saying, what a blessing. Hitler. In his lifetime, he was hated. By his own. It was only because of his power that people respected him. But he wasn't loved. That's what it means. V'shem Rishayim Yilkav. Achashverosh as well. You see that the whole destruction that happened was because they had everything, but it wasn't enough. The same also with the whole story of Purim. I'm just going to finish off with just concluding with an idea about Purim itself. Okay, so the, the idea of Purim, what's the idea of Purim? It says, Chayav inish libesume adeloyada. A person needs to drink on Purim. Very strange rule that we have. You need to drink on Purim until you don't know the difference between Baruch Mordechai, blessed is Mordechai, and cursed is Haman. That's strange, right? Isn't it strange? Not Jewish-like. Many rabbis, Rambam, many rabbis say, it doesn't mean that you should get completely drunk. It says, Libesume. Lit Basem means to get, you know, uh, high, but not not to get to a point where you're absolutely drunk, incapable of... Like, that's definitely not what they're talking about. That's according to the Rambam, but many other rabbis say that that really is. The Ramah also says that, that doesn't mean you should sleep a bit, and then once you're sleeping, you don't know the difference. So that's also counted. But many, many, according to Jewish law, is brought down that really you should drink. Mm. It's very strange. We're not that type of people. But somehow, when it comes to Purim, we drink. A very strange phenomenon. It's not the type of people we are. So what is behind that? Okay, what's, what, what are we trying to do in terms of drinking? Now, I'm not promoting drinking, but I'm just telling you that there's a message behind the drinking that we do on Purim, which is revealing something. It says that there's three things that, um, that, are, that we do that cover what we really are. Three ways a person, we could see exactly who they are. What three ways? It's good for dating. Right, one of them is when he's drinking. The way he's drinking shows me Kiso Kosova Castle. If you listen, it sounds the same, right? Kiso Kosova Castle. Kiso means his pocket. Kosova means his cup, his drink, his alcohol. And Kaas is his anger. But they're all the same word. They all mean to cover. Lechasot, kaf samach, is the root, and it all means to cover. When somebody is angry, kaas, what happens? 
His true colors come out. He's tested. Suddenly someone's angering him. At that moment, he's tested. Also, when it comes to dating, a person should always... One of the things that you always look for is to know how that person reacts. Not like you should get him angry and then say, ah, see? Right? But, <laughs> but one of the things you should do... Bad advice. <laughs> right, that's obviously bad advice. But one of the things you should do is how does he react to difficult situations? Okay, that's a very good indicator of someone special. Because that's where his true colors are shown to you. Otherwise, he's, he's putting on a great show. Suddenly, whilst he's dating with you, his mom comes in the show. And she's like, hey, can I give you some food? Like, mom, I'm busy dating, leave me alone. Right? How does he react? You, you get what I'm saying? How do you react when you're challenged? Is really going to show me who that person is. So let me ask you a question. Wait, before I ask you a question. So I just said anger is one way. Kisa is your pocket. What's in your pocket? Money. money. The way you act with money shows your true colors as well. If all of a sudden you're about to lose money, are you able to give money? A person should be a person that gives, but not too much. Nadav means to be a generous person, but not someone that's a pazran in Hebrew, which means you give all your money. That's bad. You have to be a person within the right numbers to give charity, but not too much, not too little. A person who knows how to spend money well, it shows me his true colors, how he looks at people, how he looks at the world, how he looks at money, how he values things. I'm not too attached to my physical self. I'm able to give over to others. It shows you how I care about others. And the last one is in drinking. When someone drinks yayin, secrets come out. That's what it says in the Talmud. Yayin is the gematria of 70. Yud, Yud is 20, no one is 50, 70. And Sod, secrets, is also 70. Samach is 60, Bav is 6, and Dalad is 4. When somebody drinks wine, the secrets come out. Why? Why 70? 70 is a number of a completion. There were 70 members of Sanhedrin, 70, we call it 70 nations of the world. There's, there's more nations in the world. But we understand that there's seven of every type, Shivim Panim La Torah, in every topic, there's 70 aspects to it. We always number it down to 70 in every topic. Everything comes from one source. But in every topic, everything, so it's a complete. When somebody drinks wine, everything comes out. When somebody's drinking, also we see what his true colors are, what's his thoughts, what he's thinking. What's going on in his mind? Let me ask you a question. We said that when someone drinks, his true color comes out. When he gets angry, his true colors come out. When he is dealing with money, his true colors come out. Those are the three ways that you unveil the person. So who's the real person when he's angry or when he's not angry? Angry. Not angry. Isn't that weird? Mm-hmm. You're, both saying, you're both saying good things. My real me is when I'm angry, but that's what it's kind of saying. When I uncover myself, through my anger, I uncover my real identity. When I drink and I go crazy, is that the real me? That's not the real me. The real me shouldn't be that, but that's what we're basically saying, that when I drink, the secrets come out, meaning the real self comes out. So I want to define this idea and then translate that into... Purim, and then finish up. So, what does it mean that the, the real me comes out? There's two parts of all of us. There's two of us everywhere we go. Okay? There's who we really are and what we want ourselves to be. Okay? What we want ourselves to be is how we would act in front of other people. Like when you, when you date, you look at your date a lot of times more on how you want yourself to be with him than where you are. It's a big problem sometimes. I'm holding this, way, this far Jewishly, but when I'm dating, I want somebody to holding that far Jewishly because that's where I want to be. But excuse me, but you're not holding there. Right? I want to be there in a year from now. So that's the type of guy. I, but you can't hold your date. I say this to guys too, don't worry. You can't hold your date to a standard 
that you want yourself to be in when you're not there yourself. Does that make sense? It just doesn't work. We had a, there was a girl that, we, that used to come to our house in Oregon, and she said, I want a guy that's, that studies in yeshiva. So we said, excuse me, it's great, but I don't know if the guy would want a girl that studies in Oregon and never went, Oregon, and never went to, to seminary or, or a girl's yeshiva. It doesn't work like that. You have to have an immersive experience in Judaism. And then the guy that you want will want you. But if you don't, as good as you are, you're an amazing girl. No question about it. But that guy that you're dreaming of will never want you because you're not holding in the place that you want to be. Do you understand? There's where we are and where we want to be. When I'm in public and there's people around me, I act in a certain way mainly of how I want myself to be looked at and mainly of how I want myself to really be. When no one's watching, that's who I really am. Now, when I take out that money, when I'm challenged with drinking, and my true colors come out, that's why, it's, that's why we say when someone drinks, you see your true colors, right? When someone gets angry, you see your true colors. We, you're, ref you're reflecting of who you really are right now, not of how you want yourself to be. It's where you're holding right now. Now that is exactly what Amalek and Haman was trying to, te to say about the Jews. Do you know what they said about the Jews? Ah, they are amfuzal fulad, they argue, they're not one, they're not... Where they are is very different to, they, to where they hold themselves to be. They hold themselves to be on a much higher standard. But where they're really holding, eh, they're much worse. And Haman said all these things. That's why Haman, Amalek, comes from the word safik. It's the same numerical value. Amalek comes from the same numerical value as uncertainty. Because the whole point of Amalek is to bring uncertainty into the world. To say, there's no chance. Eh, what's the point anyway? What's the point of good? What's the point of spirituality? Right? We hear this talk. What's the point of doing good? What's the point of mitzvot anyway? Why are you bothering? Right? All this talk is the talk of Amalek. They started that talk of bringing uncertainty to the human being. Saying, you're a lowly being anyway. You, you, you messed up. You're not going to succeed. You failed. That was the story of Achashverosh. What was he celebrating? 70 years. Where he said after 70 years, ah, there's no way. The Jews are done. They're, they're, they're gone. That's it. The calculations messed up. God's left them. And Haman as well. Ah, there's no hope with them. They are a people that are separated. They are broken. They are far apart. They are not. And he put lots. Why lots? To show that everything's a coincidence. There's no purpose in this world. Forget it. All is a coincidence. So he made lots and he confused us to make us think that nothing has a real reason. But really everything has a reason in it fully. That's why we need to know. Maybe I may be dirty in, in, on the outside. I may be wrong and full of mistakes, but I'm still beautiful. I'm beautiful on the inside. And that's what it says in uh, Shira Shirim and Songs of Songs. We need to know that although maybe I made mistakes and I'm not fully perfect, and I've, but we are a people that are like in the story of Purim. We are in Galut exile for thousands of years. Jews have been through thousands of years of challenges. And every small mitzvah that we do is very valuable. We can't think like Haman thought. We can't allow that uncertainty to come into us and say, eh, you're a failure. You're not going to succeed. You won't get there. You can't let that language get to you because we need to know that we've been through 3,000 years of a lot of challenges, nation after nation. And every small mitzvah that we do is so much more powerful. Yes, there's a reason to the soul. Yes, there is a neshama. Yes, that the body is important, but it's not the goal. And yes, everything that we do has a reason and a purpose and, and a power. And that's really the message here. What we do on Purim is we're, 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 celebra we're drinking, and what we're doing is we're revealing the hiddenness of who we really are. And we were trying to show that who we really are 
is very, very close to who we want to be. It's actually not that far off. From who we are is to what we want to be. That is what happens when a person drinks. It has to be, the, by the way, according to Judaism, that's why we fast. One of the reasons that the Maggid says, explain to the Bet Yosef, one of the reasons that we fast the day before Purim is so that we can make sure, it's a prayer to make sure that when we drink on Purim, we'll do it in the right way. So we don't come out worse off. And you should know, when I grew up in yeshiva, and when I studied in yeshiva for many years, there were rabbis that would cry the entire day. That's why Purim is called Yom Kippurim. They would get drunk, stone drunk. They would pray and cry for hundreds of names. They'd have lists and lists of names of people and cry their eyes out for them. Because Purim is a day which is like Purim. It's a very, very powerful and meaningful day. The Gaon of Vilna says that, why is it like Purim? Pur on, because every Jewish holiday has to be half Half of it needs to be for God, where you read the Torah, you celebrate, you say the story, right, Passover, let's say. Half of it's for God, where you say the story and you read and you keep the, the Yom Tov, right? And half of it is for you, where you eat. So the God of Vilna says, Yom Kippur is a holiday. It's not a sad day. Even though we fast, it's known as a holiday. Yom Kippur is only for God. There's no eating. There's no drinking. There's no feasting. There's only for Hashem. So where's the half for you? He says that's, that's Purim. Purim is the half for you, half for God. Isn't that interesting? Like all the other holidays, it's half for you, half God on the holiday itself. Purim is, half, is the other half of Yom Kippur. And he has a tremendous power for you to elevate yourself spiritually in ways that we cannot imagine to reveal the inner self, who we are, that it's much more beautiful and much more in power and tune to whom we want to be as well. Who we are is very much in tune with who we want to be and that's where we can achieve that um, idea. Anyway, so those are some of the ideas of uh, Purim and I hope you guys enjoyed.